he put handcuffs on me and had me sit on the curb as he processed his paperwork to only to come back, remove the handcuffs, give me my ticket and send me on my way. In the middle so of winter. I was handcuffed uh, in the middle of winter. In Chicago. Sitting on the curb. Super cold. In Chicago. Less than 32 degrees. Welcome to the Resilient Podcast. My name is Erasmo Arturo Montalban, a.k.a. The Resilient Brazilian. The Resilient Podcast is a weekly conversation with, for, and by educators. Our goal is to reimagine education, share insights from leaders, innovators, experts, and teachers. According to Angela Duckworth, grit is the single most important factor in determining success. But resilience is also about wit. Our guest today, Demetrius Hobson, has both grit and wit. Demetrius is a career educator with nearly two decades of experience. He was a principal in Chicago and a founding principal in a school in San Francisco. He is Morehouse and Harvard educated. Demetrius is the founder of Liberate History, a culturally centered curriculum consulting firm, and is, in my humble opinion, one of Chicago's leading anti-racist educators. Demetrius, how you doing, brother? Oh, man, I'm doing phenomenal after such a grand introduction. I really appreciate that, brother. You have humbled my heart. Tell us about your new project, Liberate History, and what is the origin story? Well, thank you for asking. Liberate History is a passion of mine that has been simmering in the back of my consciousness ever since I started really studying African American history at Morehouse College. And that was this notion that we can create African American history lessons for educators to make it easier for them to access content, especially those educators who are critically conscious and have the uh, impetus to make sure that they teach an American history that is inclusive of all Americans' experiences, specifically diverse Americans, specifically for me, African Americans, but all other so-called minorities that uh, have been identified in our, in our society. So uh, the origin story of Liberate History comes out of 2016. I had been a public school teacher and a principal from 2002 until 2015. I decided to take a sabbatical year and in that sabbatical year, uh, Liberate History evolved. Um, during that break, I continued my passion, which was reading history books. And I just nourished myself, got into a little yoga and meditation. Yep. And somewhere in one of my sessions, mm -hmm. uh, the, the term just came up and it was, we need some way to free history from the binds of books because that's where I was going mm -hmm. to get my history. I have a book case, I have a bookshelf here full of books, history books, but our children are not reading history books. Our children are on these screens. And so we have to find a way to get history from the books to the screens. And so I wanted to free history from the binds of books by liberating history. Wow, that's powerful, man. So what is the problem about the way students in the United States are being taught American history. We are given an American story through media, through education, yep. through just the general society. And the American story that we're given doesn't match the American reality. And it favors European Americans. Uh, it, it anglicizes, it, um, it removes the muck and mire of what really happened historically. In other words, American history is whitewash. And it, it tells us a narrative that people of color are just kind of happenstance. So Demetrius, you and I have been called by many names in the United States. Um, for example, from African-American to Negro to black to, in my case, Hispanic, Latin, Latino, Latinx. I mean, so many more, right? In 2020, there's been a new term uh, that's more inclusive. It popped up, and, and it's BIPOC, uh, which rhymes with Tupac. What would you say is the meaning of BIPOC? The way I understand BIPOC is it's Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And there's no rank by the order of the letters. It's just, I guess it flows a little better to say BIPOC. 
rather than IB POC. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Since the indigenous people were here first. But um, I take it to mean that we are trying, we are still trying in this nation to figure out how to communicate effectively to all of the diversity within America, mm. within the United States of America specifically. Mm. And so BIPOC just kind of evolved out of one, recognizing that uh, Black and Indigenous people have been some of the most oppressed people within this hemisphere, but specifically the United States of America. Right. And other people of color who have come as immigrants have also had a very difficult time navigating the social structures of the United States of America. And so uh, to just, in a, in a way, communicate to those communities, uh, we have this nomenclature, B-I-P-O-C. Got it. Thank you. And so bearing that in mind, as you said, um, indigenous, black, immigrant communities have... Um, been oppressed in the United States of America throughout history. What would you say when they say that the quest for African-American history is somehow unpatriotic? When I think about where we are as a nation today, we're seeing that there's a split, almost 50-50, at least in our electorate, around what values uh, are important to us as a society. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we still have a legacy of xenophobia within the United States of America. And I believe we have that legacy of xenophobia because we are miseducating our children. Uh, the, the one space where we have an opportunity to address the value of human life on a consistent basis throughout this nation is in our public and private and charter schools across the country. And it's in that space where we have an opportunity to teach American history as it truly happened, not as we want it to happen, not as we wish it happened, but as it truly happened. And America has, unfortunately, a nefarious past when it comes to, uh, one, migrating, uh, the, colon the colonists migrating to, the, to this country, to this land, rather, uh, establishing the colonies here, yeah. pushing out the indigenous population, uh, creating local governments, establishing states mm -hmm. and the establishment of states, bringing in Africans as enslaved humans to work on plantations for profit, uh, yeah. increasing the enslaved population, while at the same time treating immigrants who come to this country uh, as, you know, uh, as less than human, uh, to just put it boldly, as yeah. less than human. So throughout that narrative, yeah. uh, successes have been made accomplishments have been made. Uh, the project of democracy was established under those contexts. And we can't pretend that those realities haven't shaped a legacy that still feeds the xenophobia that we have today. And so when I say that with the quest for a more complete uh, US history should yeah. not be identified as some type of unpatriotic quest Mm -hmm. It's just to simply make sure that the truth is presented to our children so that they can discern for themselves uh, what they value and what they believe within this country. Instead of being spoon fed their values and beliefs, we want to present the evidence to our students so that our students can make a conscious decision about what they will stand for, what they will not stand for, and how they will advocate for justice within our nation. So with that in mind, I wanted to ask, what does saying all Lives Matter communicate to black and brown students and indigenous families in school districts? Black Lives Matter is to rebuff this notion that black people are somehow uh, more criminal or brown people are somehow more criminal than white people and therefore worthy of death because of their criminal activity. Uh, when we hear All Lives Matter, it reduces what's happening on the ground between black and brown people and the police who have this xenophobic practice in their policing. So we don't want to be reduced yeah. into the general population when yeah. we have a very specific problem. Yeah, we, we don't. We don't want to be reduced. So let me ask you, has that ever happened to you? Have you ever experienced um, xenophobic practices by people in authority? 
Have you, be, have you ever been on the receiving end? And could you share that with us? Unfortunately, Erasmo, I have. Um, I'm going to actually go back as recent as 2008. Uh, I was driving down 95th Street from Evergreen, just west of Western, if you're Chicago, towards Ashton. So I was driving eastbound right. on 95th Street. And the Evergreen police uh, pulled me over. Uh, he said that I was pulled over because I ran the red light, or rather I drove through a yellow light that turned red while I was in the intersection. He pulled me over. And when I gave him my license and registration, uh, he made this one statement that kind of gave me a clue as to what was going to happen next. He said, uh, I hope that you're proud of your president. And we had just elected Barack Obama. So my heart dropped. He went back to his uh, cruiser. He started running my plates and everything. He came back, he asked me to get out of the vehicle. And when he asked me to get out of the vehicle, he asked me if I had any weapons on me or any weapons in the vehicle, or any contraband. What? You know, I'm a Chicago public school uh, teacher and I'm a civil servant just like you, sir, is what I said to him. You know, I don't have any contraband. I have nothing that's a danger to you or to me or to anyone else. He put handcuffs on me and had me sit on the curb as he processed his paperwork to only to come back and remove the handcuffs, give me my ticket and send me on my way. In the middle so of winter. I was handcuffed uh, in the middle of winter. In Chicago, sitting on the curb super cold. In Chicago, less than 32 degrees, you know, and that was the experience. And it was an act of aggression that I had no power to respond to except for to send a complaint once I, you know, was less startled and able to recollect my thoughts and get home safely, which that became my prime, prime priority to get home safely. Man, I'm so sorry, man. That's my stuff. Yeah, that was tough, brother. That was tough. But being a resilient man that I am. I got home, I wrote down all of my thoughts and feelings in that moment, and I filed a complaint. I filed a complaint against that police officer. Wow, what happened? Well, I received a letter uh, from the Evergreen Park Police saying that they received a complaint and that they will conduct an investigation. And if there are any findings or if there are any further information that they need from me on my experience, they will call me in to, uh, to participate in the investigation, but uh, I never received any more communication from them. You never got that call. About that incident. But I believe that it's so important that never got that call. I got the letter, but I never got the call. But I think it's important for us to document those instances whenever they happen, because you'd be surprised at the pattern that will show up in a police officer's record of abuse of power. So both you and I were, were principals. Um, there aren't many principles um, that look like you and me. And no. so I'm wondering, especially because we see a lot of xenophobic practices from people who have authority, how can school leaders and teachers, when they're predominantly don't look like us, how can school leaders and teachers make school systems more anti-racist? I think... I think the key to it, see, every year we open up our schools, we start off with some framework. We set the agenda for the year. We right. establish a framework for how we're going to operate as an organization. Yeah, a I vision, a theme. A, yeah. yeah cor correct. When we establish that, I think as the leader, it is our job to identify a framework of anti-racism mm. and include that in our opening professional development and establish some of that language in our vision so that as an organization, our foundation is built off of that framework. One framework I propose is the critical race theory. CRT. Uh, critical race theory, CRT. Yeah. Uh, there are five tenets to critical race theory. And I think an, edu an educational leader could use those five tenets very effectively in creating a framework for anti-racist organization. Yes. Racism is rooted in the past, but it operates and it manifests in the present. Okay. So Correct. I, I'd, I'd like to know how do we eliminate it in the future? And 
And since racism was so bad during slavery, during Jim Crow, and it's so bad during COVID-19, what are some takeaways that educators can take that they can implement starting right now? I think it begins with being able to have those courageous conversations, uh, particularly around individual instances. But for those of us that have the capacity and the tech, the skill and the expertise to uh, address it as an organ at, a, at, at an organizational level, yes, then uh, we as a community have to advocate on their behalf. And so we have to be willing to have uh, critical conversations around what inclusivity means. And inclusivity doesn't mean I'm just a face in a space, that I'm a person bringing an experience. And that's one of the critical race theory tenets. Experiential uh, knowledge is expertise. I am bringing some expertise because of my life experiences, and that will bring value to your organization, to your corporation. And as a result, we will all have a better program, better product, a better uh, educational program for our children. Uh, because we are meeting the needs of all of the people who are either consumers or yeah. producers of these products and goods and services. So, uh, so I, I would argue that we'd be willing to have those critical conversations and then move from conversation to demonstration. Mm -hmm. That once we establish that we can have some reconciliation in our conversation, then we take action. And taking action is more than just simply putting a face in a space, but actually letting that person manifest all of their talent, skill, and expertise in the space where they have been placed. Ever since you, you launched Liberate History, you've been taking a lot of action. What are, what's some of the impact that Liberate History is, is having? Uh, we have had quite a number of opportunities to create curriculum for organizations. So uh, I sit on the National Advisory Board for the Carter Center for K-12 Black History Education and Research at the University of Missouri under the leadership of uh, Dr. LeGarry King. And uh, we've put on three conferences, the Teach Black History Conference. Mm -hmm. They are a national conference. We've grown from 200 to 1,000 teachers who come to our conference over three days uh, since it was, it was, we started off as a two-day conference. Now we're a three-day conference. Uh, right now, to accommodate the needs of people in COVID and to make sure that we're safe, uh, our conference is virtual. But we've grown from 200 participants to over 1,000 educators who want to learn how to teach Black history. And so we're having an impact in our relationship there with uh, the Carter Center for K-12 Black History Education. Most recently, uh, secured a contract with New Zella and the New Zella Corporation, which is an online platform. They reach over 30 million uh, students across the United States of America, their digital platform. Yep. And so we've provided some consultancy around how they can open up a U.S. Black history collection and, and really approach it from an anti-racist perspective. So through our consultancy, we are potentially going to impact 30 million youth through New Zealand. Thank you for sharing that. If folks at home, educators who are listening and watching this, want to start their own collection uh, of books, it, could you give us one? There are a series of books that I highly recommend. Um, I will start with Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett. Mm. Um, second, I would add uh, John Hope Franklin's um, From Slavery to Freedom. Yes. Uh, those are two books that I think will provide a comprehensive uh, narrative of the African experience in America. Uh, most recently published is Stamp by oh, yeah. Ibram X. Kendi. Yeah. An excellent read. Mm -hmm. So uh, for, for adults, I would recommend those books for adults. Now for middle school and high school students, Stamp has been remixed mm -hmm. by Jason Reynolds. That's right. And so there's a Stamp remix, and I would recommend that book for middle school and high school students. And it's a very interactive book. The, the words pop, and they have different fonts and different sizes. It's just, and, and the chapters, you know, some are, are 
quick and then some are longer. It's very accessible. Chapter seven is oh. one sentence. Yeah, yeah exactly. Africans are not savages. That's it. That's, yeah. the, that's the chapter. That's the sentence. That's the paragraph. Africans are not savages, period. Yes. And then to better understand the nuances, what is the difference between, uh, say, an anti-racist and not racist? Action. Action is the difference. So not racist, meaning that an individual may not have a bias towards another individual based on their skin color. Anti-racist says that individual takes action to fight against any bias that exists within themselves or anyone within their network or anything that they see in society that is that demonstrated bias of racism. Hmm. So action is the difference between an anti-racist and a person who's simply not racist. Are you taking action? Are you putting in work to constantly educate yourself and educate others around you? Are you willing to advocate on behalf of other people so that they can experience the same justice that, that Europeans experience in America? Equality and inclusion. So action is the difference between an anti-racist and a person who's simply not racist. Wow, that's incredible, man. So, so check this out, brother. Like, you're an educator, I'm an educator. And you've taken action to become an educator. But I'd like to go a little bit back if we, if we can and, and understand what led you to become an educator. Oh, wow. <clears throat> My origin story. Um, you know, I, I am going to start with fifth grade. In fifth grade, I had I taught, a teacher. I taught fifth grade. Business. Love fifth grade. I'm listening. Oh, great. So then, you know, you know. All right. My fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Gwendolyn Martin, changed my life. Uh, in fifth grade is when I started to demonstrate some negative behaviors as a, as a youth in Chicago, growing up mm -hmm. on the south side. I've lived in seven different apartment buildings. We transitioned a lot. A lot. My father was uh, struggling with an addiction. Uh, my mother was doing her best, working multiple jobs to just try to keep, keep our bills paid and lights on and the gas on. And uh, some of that fatigue was starting to demonstrate, show up at school for me. Mm -hmm. And one day, Ms. Martin pulled me to the side and she said, Demetrius, you have so much to offer the world. I would hate to see you throw it away because you are so angry. Let go of the anger, and I'm going to show you how. And so her solution was to give me a poem, to give me a speech, to have me memorize it, to give me an audience, the class, to enter me into the speech contest, to put me on a stage, and to give me a space to work through my emotions through words that would help me to process what I was experiencing. And she gave me Black literature to memorize, and then recite uh, on a regular basis in class and annually at the annual speech contest. That, that, that just, that changed my world, man. That small little act from that teacher who took interest in not letting me fall through the cracks, but she saw some talent, some skill that she could nourish and nurture that would keep me invested in school. And as I got ready to graduate from Morehouse College, as I was matriculating out of college, I thought to myself, what would I do with all of the time, uh, all of the talent, all of the work that I put into graduating from this undergrad? What do I do with this bachelor's degree? And how can I make an impact? And I saw a flyer in my computer lab that said, mission, educate, movement, now. And it was a flyer from Teach for America. And it caught my attention because the mission was to educate and the movement was happening now. You're saying that education is a civil rights movement of our time. Yeah. Then I wanted to join that organization and I wanted to go into the classrooms in Chicago and make a difference the way Ms. Martin made a difference for me. Full disclosure, uh, I saw a, a similar flyer and I also did Teach for America um, and still in the education. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful to have you on today, uh, Brother Demetrius. Like, it's been a pleasure. 
Um, thank you for joining us. Obrigado. Uh, the Resilient Podcast is a weekly conversation where we discuss the current state of education and also the future of education. Um, we share tips on how to navigate this global pandemic, and we're unapologetic about that. Uh, sorry, not sorry. Uh, thank you again, Brother Demetrius, for spending um, this <laughs> spending time with us. Uh, and how you feeling, man? Feeling great, brother. I really appreciate this opportunity to just kind of share on your platform. I think it's beautiful that you've opened up the doors and allowed other educators to use this platform to communicate some of the great work that we're doing. And I look forward to more of your episodes. Appreciate it, brother. The same my platform, though. This is our platform. It's us. It's all of us. So let's bring everybody in. And we, we got to keep building on that civil rights movement, right? That was the promise. So we got to do our part. Yes, sir. Stay blessed, yes, sir. too blessed to be stressed, um, and say to Chicago, I love her. I miss Chicago dearly. Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, man, you said this all started with yoga, right? On a yoga session? It all started with yoga. So starting yoga session, breathing and meditating, letting it flow. Exactly. Letting it flow, brother. And it's all about flow. Namaste. Namaste.